The scary stories will begin in 40 seconds. If you're a subscriber, then you know the deal. My videos always have minimal ads. I do this for you, so that you can enjoy the video without constant interruptions. There's only three mid-roll ads in this video. One after story number one, one after story number two, and one more after story number three. After that, the rest of the video is ad-free. And that's how all my videos are, and that's how they always will be. So if you'd like to show your support, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. Now, let's begin. I'm not sure how receptive you all will be to considering this is not a tale of horror or tension. Instead, it's a very short, yet dreadful recount of something that happened when I was just a little boy. It's a flash of memory, with no discernible beginning or end. Instead, the real terror is the implications, and how it shifted my perception of what is considered safe in the world, and how it should shift yours. I'm not sure of the exact age in which this memory takes place, but I was young. Probably not even a preteen. I grew up in Washington Heights in New York City, essentially the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I was a 90s kid, born in the mid-80s. Now I am not sure about how it is now, because I live in a different state, but back then, the neighborhood was not so great, and seeing red and blue bandanas hanging out of the back of baggy jeans was just another thing. As a result, I was sheltered, not allowed to go out much because, honestly, there wasn't anything worth going out to. So, while I was used to seeing and hearing certain things, I was thankfully shielded by my mom from ever actually experiencing any of it. Anyway, this memory is one of those times I heard something. Like I said, there is no build-up to the moment. I just remember it. Just a flash in time. The moment is me, lying in bed in the middle of the night, sheet pulled up to my chin. I was on my side, facing the window. It was a large window because it was where the fire escape was, and at the moment the blinds were up, letting in the orangey glow of the streetlights outside. I'm not sure why the blinds were up, or how much they were drawn, but I do remember that glow. I was wide-eyed and listening, listening to a man I could not see, somewhere out in the street. We lived on the fourth floor, so my view was just of the apartment building across the way. The man had an accent, which wasn't surprising since Washington Heights was predominantly Dominican. He sounded older, maybe middle-aged approaching elderly, but it was hard to tell. It was hard to tell because he was wailing and moaning. The only word he occasionally called out was help. Between his exasperated groans, he sounded in so much pain. I just listened and waited for other voices, or for any kind of commotion or response. But there wasn't any. I remember it went on for quite a while. Now, at some point, there was a response, of course, but I just don't remember. My memory ends and stops there. I knew there had to be some kind of response because the story of what happened came out. Apparently, a cab driver got into an argument with his patron when dropping him off. They both stepped out of the vehicle, and the patron stabbed the cab driver before fleeing. The cab driver then just lay there, calling for help. He lay there, and I listened to his voice echoing emptily off the surrounding brick buildings. I was transfixed by the noise. At the time, I didn't know why I was fascinated by it, but as I got older, I realized why. You see, I lived on the cross street that connected two main streets, Amsterdam and Broadway. The street was one way, so it was small and narrow, and along both sides ran four-story apartment buildings, crammed tight next to one another, all inhabited, and it's New York City. It really does never sleep. Granted, my area didn't buzz like Times Square in the middle of the night, but people were up. My point is, there was no reason that man should have been calling out for more than 30 seconds before someone responded. Just within his 500-foot radius had to be dozens of people all inside their apartments. That 
what was so fascinating, the silence that accompanied his calls. Fast forward to me sitting in psychology class my freshman year of college, and I am reading a textbook in class about the bystander effect. The concept was appalling to me as I read. If you don't know what the bystander effect is, it is essentially a phenomenon that will shatter your entire sense of safety in public places. It is an event where individuals are less likely to help a victim when others are around. A classic image, and one I saw in the textbook, is of a man sprawled out on the sidewalk of a busy street in midday with people walking around him. The book gave an example of a woman who was dragged through the streets of a suburb in broad daylight by an assailant. She was kicking and screaming, and the man assaulted her. And no one called the police. No one came outside. Everyone closed their blinds because they were afraid and thought, someone must have called 911. This concept haunted me for days, because I, will again reiterate, lived in New York City, where sprawled out homeless people or druggies or drunks or whoever were everywhere. How many times have I walked by an unmoving body in a train station? How many times have I seen someone being harassed in a crowded train car and everyone just looked away? Looking back now, I think the concept hit me so hard because I subconsciously linked it to that memory of the wailing man. From then on, till this very day, I always stay aware of my surroundings with that phenomenon in mind. Now you might still be wondering where the horror is. Well, I want you to imagine that you are being followed by a very creepy person. So you duck into a busy coffee shop and feel at ease. Now imagine that person just comes over and pulls out a knife. What do you think is going to happen? Do you honestly think someone will risk their own life to wrestle down that man for his knife? just to save you? Now think about what happens after he stabs you. Believe it or not, he is most likely going to just walk out of that shop with people cowering away from him. Now you are bleeding and people are finally starting to help. Fifteen minutes go by and you realize no one has called the ambulance because everyone assumes someone else did. Like I mentioned, I have ridden public transportation and seen examples of this a few times. People look the other way because they are afraid. I stepped in a couple of times, but I remember I was terrified each time, and I definitely let some stuff go, because you honestly have to judge and assess the situation and be realistic. This is the reality, that the reassurance you feel by being in a public place is an illusion. Look at it logically. By feeling safe in public, you are essentially placing your trust in complete strangers. You are literally relying on their heroism, and that is ridiculous. Would you jump in and save or help a man being pushed around by a huge muscular guy over six feet tall? Doubtful, but this is what you choose to believe for yourself. Look around the next time you are outside. Those are the people that you are entrusting your life with when danger hits at that moment. And remember, the more people around, the less likely you will be helped. That's the dread that this early childhood memory instilled upon me. Knowing that most of us are wired for self-preservation. Knowing that if you are lying out in the street, bleeding out and wailing weakly for help, nearby bystanders will just close their blinds and raise the volumes of their television. And they will feel no guilt because, after all, someone will end up helping, right? I have lived in about seven houses my entire life, and since my parents are divorced, the amount is higher. That and my mother moves around quite a bit. About three years ago, we lived in the countryside, a few miles away from the nearest town, but not completely isolated. We had neighbors right behind us and then down from us. There was also a horse riding facility nearby and a lot of fields. I didn't really like living there. The house was always dark and cold and I never really liked how out of the way we were. I was used to living literally right next to a busy street. I always found the surrounding countryside very eerie. 
Our garden was huge. There was a clubhouse, a garage, and a weird storage house, along with a very large gravel driveway. That'll be relevant later. Now, I never actually experienced any sort of unusual activity inside the house. It was always outside. At night, I'd often hear the gravel crunching, as if someone was walking over it, which was creepy enough. But that's not all. I would constantly hear animal noises. A cow mooing, frequently. A strange sort of squawking, which didn't sound like any sort of animal I had heard before. You might be thinking, what's weird about hearing cows in the country? Well, there were no cows anywhere. There were vast fields, but all overgrown and not in use, so no farmers had placed any of their livestock there. The mooing was frequent, always seemed to happen during the night, while other strange noises seemed to circulate too. The clubhouse had a small window that looked straight into the window of one of the bedrooms. My bedroom at first, but I could never shake the feeling that sometimes there would be a print of a face left in the form in condensation so I moved to another one. I would sometimes take my dog for walks in the field right next to our house, but I would never go far. The feeling I got was so sinister, I'd often end up literally running through the field back home. One day I found a saw lying in the middle. It seemed brand new, except the ridges were dirty brown. I'd like to hope it was just rusting. I had found a lot of dead animals in the field, more than was natural, I would say. There was always the sickly sweet smell of decay lingering outside. One summer evening, in the distance, I could hear laughing, faint screaming of a girl, and flickers of fire in the wooded distance. I told my mother to come out and listen, but she told me it was probably just someone having a party. I didn't believe her. I can't explain any of those events, they're all kind of random, and I am telling them to the best I can remember. But the theory I stick to is the countryside was probably the ideal place for some sort of cult gatherings. I wouldn't put it past them to have wandered throughout the gardens, mine included, and got up to some freaky stuff in the fields out in the back, hidden by the woodland. I don't really know. There were a lot of fires that burned in the far distance. A lot of strange noises so that's really the only logical explanation I can think of. Sometimes a car would be parked on the road outside my house during the night, then gone by morning. But I can only speculate. Whatever the reasons, it's a scary prospect, and hopefully there was nothing of a sinister nature going on. So some backstory. It happened in the summer of 2016, and I was currently spending a couple nights alone, at home, while my parents were away on a trip. I don't live in the nicest of cities, but live in a relatively nice neighborhood, since it is right next to a major university. I have been followed home a couple times, had neighbors have their homes broken into, and the like. But most of the really bad stuff happens in the downtown area of my city. So it was late at night on my second night home alone. It was around 11 p.m. I had been playing some video games with a couple buddies of mine when I decided to go downstairs and make a late night snack. Cliché setting, I know. When you walk down my stairs, you make a 180 degree turn to walk down a short hallway that opens into my kitchen slash living room. When you open the door from the hallway into the kitchen, Across from the kitchen table is a set of doors that open into the backyard. The two doors have giant windows that cover the whole door, kind of like a storm door, I guess. Those will become relevant later. As I go into the kitchen and start making some ice cream, I thought I heard some laughing. Now at first I thought it was just my phone, since I had happened to be listening to a scary story podcast at the time. However, as I paused my podcast and waited a second, the laugh came yet again. The sound was... odd. The best way I can describe it would be like if you took the Star Wars character Yoda's laugh and made it a little creepier. 
It was childlike and playful, yet it was deep and sadistic. The laugh repeated again a third time, this time a little louder. I began to look around, wondering if it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I walked over to the sink, where one of the windows that looks out to my backyard was, and I just saw darkness. There didn't seem to be anything out there, but right as I was about to look away, a face appeared at my window. I immediately jumped back and gasped. The face got closer to the window. It was a man, and he had a giant, cartoonish smile on his face. He let out another one of those laughs and walked towards the two screen doors next to the sink. He began to jiggle the lock, all the while laughing and tapping at the window. I bolted upstairs, locking myself in my room with my phone in hand. Just as the operator picked up, I heard glass shatter downstairs, and the laugh, that terrible creepy laugh, echoed throughout the house. I trembled and stuttered as I told the operator my situation. She told me to keep calm and that an officer would be there soon. As I pulled the phone away from my ear for a second, I noticed that it was silent. I stood there, the wooden floorboards creaking as my weight shifted. Then, I heard it. That laugh. It was quiet at first. Then it got louder. I could hear the man walking up my stairs, the floorboards creaking louder with each step. It got louder and louder, and before I could realize what was happening, he was at my door. I stayed completely silent, ready for him to come in. He tried the door. The lock jiggled. He began to laugh even more as he started to pound on the door. The pounding got louder as he began to throw himself against the door. The latches started to give way. That's when I saw it. The flashing lights. The police had finally arrived. Before I knew it, they found a way in and I just stood there frozen. The man let go of the door and just started maniacally laughing that terrible creepy laugh. He laughed when the police got upstairs. He laughed as they took him outside, and I swear, I could hear him laugh as he was put into the back of their car. Public transportation in this city was horrible. Buses stopped running around 11 p.m., about 30 minutes before I could leave work. Every night, I had an hour walk to look forward to. The wages for a dishwasher were barely enough to cover rent, much less a car. No one from work wanted to drive into my neighborhood. All I could depend on were my blown out sneakers to get me home. By the time I made it back, I was almost too tired to work my key in the deadbolt. One of these nights, being halfway there, I was on the stretch of steep downward hill that went on for the next couple of miles. You would think that this was the easy part, but holding yourself back from gravity gave a little twist of misery to my crap Sunday. I was a couple of blocks into it when I noticed a car pulled up onto the sidewalk on the side of the street. It was a huge LTD and was facing the opposite way of traffic. The rear end was a good three feet into the lane. The first thing I noticed was the windshield was halfway caved in. I assumed there was an accident, but proceeded as normal squeezing between the front bumper and a low wall without missing a beat. The driver noticed me and asked, Hey man, you need a ride? I told him, I'm going the other way man, thanks though. Half hoping it would be a deal breaker. Nah man, jump in. You look beat, brother. How far are you going? I figured what the hell, I can take care of myself. Growing up, and living in the neighborhoods, I have tested that more than enough. My street sense was tingling on one hand, but on the other, I just wanted a break for once. I wasn't completely stupid though. I explained where I was going, but the location was two blocks from where I was actually going. After waiting for traffic to pass, I was able to get in the passenger side, brushing safety glass off the cracked vinyl seat. Being pointed uphill, the massive door almost took me off at the ankle. I tried the electric window toggle, mainly to keep an exit available, 
but also to air out the stink. It would only go down about five inches before getting jammed. The interior looked like a rat's nest. Seats were all cut up, and the fluff was sticking to me like cat hair. The amount of garbage in the back made it barely possible to see out of the rear window. The rear view mirror was gone anyway, sitting on the front seat, a casualty of whatever busted his windshield in. The guy floored it in reverse and did a terrifying J-turn, barely missing cars, coming up the hill from a blind turn. The suspension floated and bounded as we tore down the hill at breakneck speed. He explained that he had just stolen gas from just across the state line, and that's how the windshield got busted. All I could do was mutter a, uh, cool man, and was resigned to just get this ride over with. Sooner than expected, we finally hit the bottom of the hill. My drop-off was about a quarter of a mile ahead, and I started the parting process with, Hey man, thanks. I appreciate you doing this. Planning on just saying thanks once more, offered a buck, handshake, and exit stage right. Too bad that couldn't have been the way it actually went. At my corner, he suddenly pulled a hard, fast right. The tires screeched as we drifted into oncoming traffic. I want to find some smoke real quick, he announced. I low-key tried the door handle. It just pulled with no tension. It wasn't connected. Yeah, cool man. You can drop me here. I don't smoke, so I'm good to go on that. He acted like I wasn't even there and continued to race down the littered side streets. He had seen someone walking and slowed down enough to ask loudly if they had any, or where he could find some. Not very smart for my neck of the woods. I knew it was pointless. Nobody was going to deal with this dude. We ended up going up another steep hill, away from my destination. I kept scanning for weapons, the best thing being the mirror. He was going so fast and the hill streets were curvy. I thought I would probably die in a wreck if I took him out. We reached the top of the hill, and he turned sharply into the parking lot of a closed Taco Bell. I could feel a shift in demeanor, and it got real. As soon as he stopped, not even in park yet, I grabbed him by the back of his head and rammed it into his sagging windshield. The second time, I put his head completely through. It didn't knock him out, though. He screamed with an animal rage as I was trying to get my arm through the window. After losing a little flesh on my elbow, I was able to squeeze enough out. I let myself out and was stuck in the window for a moment. As I pulled myself free, I saw him extract himself from the jagged hole his head created. It was a mask of murder, streaming with blood. The eyes were lit with pure insanity. His half-rotted teeth fully barred into a bestial smile. He screamed unintelligibly at me as I started sprinting down the hill. Gravity grabbed me by the balls, and soon I was unable to even slow myself down, my right sneaker finally being pushed past the limit of its tolerance, disintegrated into shards of rubber and canvas. My left shoe simply couldn't hold up to the speed and flew off shortly after. It was shortly after that that I ate dirt. When I fell, I did some weird kind of cartwheel that ended with me bouncing and then skidding down the sidewalk, ending up next to a parked car. It was good timing though. It seemed as though just after my fall, his car came cruising down the hill. He was going normal speed and scanning both sides of the street. I pulled myself up into a ball, sitting in front of the rear wheel in case for some reason he could see under cars. He passed me and I waited until he was out of sight before moving. I crouched and limped my way further down, almost considering doubling back to throw him off. There weren't side streets anywhere until you reached the bottom, so it was either backwards or forwards. He passed me an additional six times before I hit the bottom. I wasn't bleeding much, but the road rash was incredibly painful. I had landed on my hip bone during my fall and each step made it throb that much more. Once I did reach the bottom, I had lots of options. Being a walker, I knew every little secret way around here. I was able to reach my apartment without running into him again. 
In the light of my kitchen, I saw my damage. My elbows, knees, hip, and chin were ripped up. I picked little pieces of gravel and brown glass out, tried to wash it as best as I could, but sometimes you need someone to do that for you. It's hard to do it to yourself. I bit down and got it over with, finally passing out in my bed. I awoke to my sheet sticking to my back. I hadn't noticed the entire left side of my back was raw, too. Pulling it away sounded like ripping off duct tape. It stole my breath for a minute. Upon trying to get up, everything hurt, badly. It was a good excuse for a shot, even if I had to get one in my sock feet. Next was going to be burning my food money on shoes. I lived two doors down from the mother of all dive bars. It was crappy, but I had convinced them over time that I was old enough to drink. Plus they had a TV, which I didn't own at the time. I limped inside, with not even a second glance at my face scab and sock feet. I sat here drinking well swill with the waiting to die crowd when I glanced at the TV. I almost spat my drink out as the news bulletin showed a mugshot of the guy from last night. I asked them to turn it up and caught the story. He had murdered three people a few days ago, then stabbed a gas station attendant 11 times. He survived and threw a brick at the windshield somehow. He was caught after a chase that ended in him hitting a pole. After his arrest upon, searching his car, they found two unidentified bodies in the trunk. In his back seat, they found a dozen or so pairs of underwear, none of them belonging to the suspect. Nobody at the bar believed me, even when showing them my wounds. Even when I've been broken down on the freeway, I haven't gotten into a stranger's car since. No matter how far the walk, or how nice they seem to be, it just isn't worth it. For a while, I had bad dreams about it, mainly the bloody-faced scream, staring directly into my eyes. In my dreams, he was trying to transfer it to me, infect me with whatever screaming face that was inside his head. So far, I don't think it worked but maybe someday you'll see me on the news. Only time will tell. I was 11 years old. At the time, I was living in an apartment situated on a street with an ongoing construction. Needless to say, they often tapped into the electric supply and the power fluctuated quite a bit. Therefore, the streetlights often served no real purpose, especially in the winters, when evening dawned on us with pitch-black darkness. That is relevant, so keep it in mind. From what I remember, it was a weekend I was supposed to spend at my friend's house. For an 11-year-old me, this was an exciting prospect, having been loaded with schoolwork the entire week. I was to spend what I believed to be Friday night, sleeping over and spend the entirety of Saturday at her bungalow to return home that very evening. What made it even better was the fact that her parents had an event they could not avoid and therefore trusted us to stay alone in their two-floor house for the entirety of the six hours they were gone. Back then, the idea of spending a whole night alone with my friend was great. No interference and a whole six hours of games and movies on their huge TV. As it turns out, my friend had other ideas. I arrived at her house just short of 8 p.m. It was already pretty dark out and her parents had waited for me to arrive before telling us about emergency contacts, dinner, and such. They also reminded us to get their four-year-old Labrador inside as the weather was acting up and his kennel had a few loose panels which leaked when it rained. This is also an important fact to be noted. After they left, we watched a few cartoons, had dinner, and were chilling in her living room playing cards. That's when my friend Sid had the ingenious idea of exploring a fenced plot of land a few hundred meters down the street that she resided on. There was no construction happening in there, so what little of that area didn't have shambles was overgrown with plants and weeds. We got the dog inside, leashed it to its long chain, 
and allowed it to roam within reason. Got the keys and left the house to make the short 10 minute trip. At this point, it was about 10 p.m. In retrospect, this is where we still had a chance to avoid this particular encounter, but being the curious and daring 11 year olds that we were, we ventured anyways. Rather uneventful, we arrived and set to climbing over the two meter wall. Luckily for us, the wall was broken enough in places to make good holds to carry us over. Once inside, Sid suggested that we sit a few meters away from each other for as long as we could until one of us was too scared to do so. We faced each other and walked backwards till there was just enough light to see the general silhouette of the other. After what seemed to me like a good ten minutes, I saw Sid's hunched form rise and start to walk towards me. She seemed to be walking rather fast and in a haphazard manner, jumping over rocks and such at a daring pace, even getting cut by some thorns in the process. She came up to me and just as I was about to laugh and call her out on being scared, she told me to get up because she needed to go feed Shaggy. I remember being really confused because her parents had already filled his bowl with food and he had this water thing which he could operate in case he was thirsty. But I saw her face, and let me just say, I have never seen her this pale. She looked like she had seen a ghost. So without asking questions, I said okay, and we made our way back over the wall, albeit in a tense manner and rather quickly. The moment my feet touched the ground, I felt Sid grab my arm and straight up just started sprinting down the street. To put things into perspective, I had a bruise from the way she grasped it for two weeks straight. So we ran, arrived at her house, and went in through her front yard fence gate, a towering metal gate without bars, and she told me to unlock the front door while she deadbolted the metal gate's various locks into the ground and the two gates to each other. At this point, I was starting to panic but we got into the house, and Sid then proceeded to run around the house, locking and closing all possible windows and doors, as well as pulling the curtains shut. I was very confused as to why she was doing this, and so was her dog, who stood there and followed her around while she did so. After about ten minutes, she came back into the ground floor living room, and with a very scared expression, explained to me that the reason she did all that was because while we were sitting apart... She happened to glance away from me, a few meters to my right, to see another human silhouette crouching in the bushes. She thought she was imagining it until it moved closer to where I was sitting and seemed to be unaware that my friend was watching them. She did not want to startle me or the person, and so she made up having to feed her dog as an excuse to get out of there without alerting the person still crouching. After hearing this, I was quite shaken and we hugged for a few minutes, deciding not to tell our parents, as they had very much warned us not to go out of her compound. We did not want this to be the last of our time alone together, having fun, and so we peeked out of the window into the street, which seemed to be empty, as far as we could see, and proceeded to put it behind us, as excitement took over our minds once again. I would have loved to say that that was the end of it, but what happens next has stuck with me till date, and I hold a fear of that situation from that point onward. To give you an idea of the layout of her compound, her house was surrounded on two sides by a lawn, and the lawn was then surrounded by a wall some two and a half meters high. The wall had one entrance, which were the tall metal gates I talked about previously. The house itself had windows all around the perimeter, as well as two potential entrances, the first being the front door, while the second being a door to this small attached space next to the house, which was made of see-through metal, like the kind which metal fences are made out of, but stronger. This space had a metal door with a lock only accessible from the inside, as well as a door which was on the wall this space was attached to inside the house. However, this door only had a deadbolt on, and was made of light wood. This is also of importance. So an hour or so in, after the incident, we were upstairs in her air-conditioned room, 
playing games on her computer and talking about whatever it is 11-year-olds talk about when we heard the dog bark downstairs. It was growling and seemed to bark at random intervals. Keep in mind that her dog was a friendly Labrador who rarely ever growled or barked aggressively. My friend went to get the dog upstairs to her room, and after she returned, she informed me that the dog was standing near the front door, growling at it, and that it took her quite a bit of effort to get him upstairs as he kept trying to go back down. We were really confused as this was unusual for him to do, and thinking that a stray dog may have caught his attention, we decided to go into the balcony attached to a room that gave us a view onto the front lawn and a part of the street directly in front of the house. Instead of seeing what we assumed would be a stray dog or cat, we looked down to see a person standing very still in her lawn and in front of her front door. In the limited light, we could make out heavy layers of muddy-looking clothing and a head full of hair that looked very matted. The dog was with us in the balcony and was whining to be let outside. We crouched in her balcony, and right as we were about to discuss what we should do, we heard what sounded like the front door rattling, as if someone was trying to open it with the handle. We creeped back downstairs only to realize that this person had now moved on to the window next to the door and was trying to open that. The realization hit that he was trying to find an entrance into the house by going around the perimeter. Just as we were about to creep back upstairs, my friend grabbed me again and in a hushed tone told me that she had forgotten to lock the attached space door in her hurry before. We both looked at each other and paled as we realized that it would gain the intruder easy access into the house as the inner door had nothing but a deadbolt. At this point, we heard the windows rattling behind the house, nearly three quarters of the way back to the front again. The attached space door was a few meters away from the front door, and we were lucky that he had chosen to go around the other side. She told me to wait by the inner door with the dog while she went outside and bolted the metal door. She then informed me to close the door as soon as she returned, and that if she was caught, to let the dog outside and to close the inner door as discreetly as possible as to not give myself away. We were both terrified, and since we had no time to argue about it, I stood guard at the inner door while she went to the outer door, fumbled with the lock, and returned inside practically running as quietly as she could. We closed the inner door, and just then, we heard the outer door rattle harshly. Had she not gone there and then, there was a big chance that we would have no choice but to hide in her house had he found his way in. After he tried opening all doors and windows, which took a while as he was doing it, quite intently and forcefully, we found our way back upstairs and went back into her balcony to see if he had gone away. As we looked down, we saw him once again standing in her front lawn. However, this time, we could see his head was tilted back and it felt like he was looking right at us. However, we knew that it was far too dark for him to be able to spot us, as along with closing all the windows and such, we had proceeded to kill the lights in her room, as well as drawn the curtains, as to not let her little bedside lamp light escape the blinds. He then started giggling in the quiet of the night, and proceeded to go down on all fours, crawling around the lawn in front of the house, while his laughter grew. In retrospect, we should have called the authorities at this point, but being the terrified 11-year-olds we were, we did not want to get into trouble for not even being able to follow simple instructions. He did this for nearly half an hour, only to stand up once again, facing the street, and then climbing on top of the kennel, in the corner, up onto the top of the wall, and jumping down. We still stood in her balcony, waiting to see if he would return, but an hour or so passed where he didn't, and that was the last we saw of him the entirety of the night, till around 2 a.m. when her parents returned. The next morning, they were very confused as to why all the doors and windows were closed on such a pleasant night, and why there was mud on the front doorknob. We said we just wanted to play in the dark inside the house, lying about the actuality of the situation, and to this day, 
I do not think the man has been caught, and to my knowledge, he has not been seen again. This happened back in November of 2018. I woke up early that morning at around 7.30 a.m. My wife usually works earlier shifts, and I drive her to work. We made it to her work at around 8 o'clock, and I got home at around 8.30. I normally work evening shifts at my job, so I try to get some more sleep as soon as I get home. That morning when I got home, I went back to bed in an attempt to fall back asleep. About 10 minutes rolled by when I got a knock on the door. My wife and I live next to my in-laws, so I just assumed it was one of them. I wasn't going to answer it, but the knocking continued. I got up to answer the door, thinking it would be one of my in-laws. To my surprise, it was this man I had never met before. He was skinny and was about 5'8", the same height as me. He proceeded to ask me if I came up to his house and put his girlfriend in my car. I immediately told him no. At the time this story occurred, my wife and I were just engaged. I told him I took my fiancé to work and came home. He kept insisting that I came up to his house, but I told him if I did, I would be honest and say that I did. As soon as I told him that, he then went on to talk about his boots and how nice they were, which I thought was kind of weird. That gave me the impression he was probably on something. He left my house afterward and went home. About 15 minutes later, he came back to my house and knocked on the door. When I answered, he said he just left his girlfriend's present on my porch. I played it safe and said okay, but I didn't remember seeing a present. The present he held up to me looked like a cheap makeup set you would give a 10 year old. Definitely not something you would give your adult girlfriend. At this point, I got very suspicious. After I shut the door again, I peeked out of the living room window to see if he was still outside. He was standing right by my brother-in-law's truck, which was close to my vehicles, looking straight at my house. It felt like we made direct eye contact. That should have been when I called the police, but once again, I let it go. Three hours went by, and I still kept replaying the scenario in my head. I had just gotten out of the shower when I heard another knock on the door. I knew it was him again, because the knock seemed more like a bang. I began to panic trying to call my brother-in-law, who lived next door, and debating on if I should call the police. I proceeded to open the door. To no surprise, it was him. As soon as he saw me, he asked me whose car was outside my house, and I told him it was mine. At that moment, his entire persona just changed. He began getting very angry. He insisted that his friend saw his girlfriend get in my car, and began talking about fighting me. I remember the words he said to me. You come out here, and we'll settle this like men, instead of you staying in your house. That's what sissies do. I'll never forget his piercing stare, as if he had completely lost his mind. Being afraid because I didn't know the guy, I tried to be the bigger person and just explain to him that I didn't do it. But the way he looked at me, and talked to me, really started to tick me off. I didn't know what to do. I told him to hang on a minute in a more aggravated tone, and began to walk outside. Within the few seconds it took me to go out on my porch, it was like a switch just flipped inside my head. I was just so angry that this guy who I didn't even know had accused me of something I didn't do and had bothered me three times in one day. I just blacked out and began yelling at the guy. He jumped off my porch before I even got outside, but continued to run his mouth. I told him to get off my property before I called the cops, which sent him running. I called the police right after, and my sister-in-law came to check on me. My brother-in-law came over soon after as well. Ten minutes after I called 911, the police arrived. I didn't know much about the guy other than what he looked like, but my in-laws knew the guy's name and where he lived. I slammed the door as he began to run away, so I didn't see how he left. My in-laws told the police and I that he left in a car, which they knew the type and model of. They knew vital information that helped the police track this guy down. They went into the direction the car he was in went. When they couldn't find him then, the police pulled up to his house. 
They approached him as he was walking toward his home, not too long after they parked. I don't know what the police said to him, but whatever they did, it worked. I stood outside my house as my grandmother-in-law pulled up and handed me a package for my wife. At the same time, the police left. The guy walked out onto the road beside his house and just stood there, staring at me. I didn't let it phase me and just continued to grab the package, going on about the rest of my day. As I left to pick up my wife from work later on, my in-laws stayed at the house to make sure everything was unharmed. The guy came back down and told my in-laws to tell me that he was sorry. My other brother-in-law, who is now deceased, approached the guy to find out why he had a problem with me. They didn't get along, but my brother-in-law put their differences aside to figure out what the problem was. Just as I suspected, he was on something. My wife and his girlfriend both have the same hair color. When I took my wife to work that morning, either he or his friend saw my wife and thought that she was his girlfriend. Though that doesn't justify what he did, I'm glad I know now why this all happened. To this day, that stands as the most terrifying experience of my life. Never in my life have I felt more scared and endangered than that day. I'm just thankful it didn't turn out worse than it did. He really had his hand on me that day. I don't have any problems with this guy anymore, but needless to say, I hope I never see him again. I work at the Walmart near where I live. At the time this story occurred, I had been working there for a little over three years. I was working one night at the customer service desk where I normally work. It was a usual night, understaffed, busy, exhausting, a typical shift at Walmart. I had a long line of people and I was the only one at the desk. Because it was busy, I was trying to get my line down as quickly as possible. One guy in the line looked a little bit different than the others. He was tall and appeared to be in his late 20s to early 30s. He was wearing a short pair of shorts, had a button-up shirt on that wasn't buttoned all the way, had long dreadlocks that almost touched the floor, and had a pair of sunglasses on his head. It wasn't his appearance that stood out to me. I have always made it a goal to not jump to conclusions based on what people look like. He was returning a printer. He had his receipt. The serial numbers matched. Everything was there. Nothing really out of the ordinary. What got me was the way he smiled and talked to me. He spoke as if he was intoxicated, and he gave a smile that looked like something you would see in a horror movie. A big smile with big, wide eyes. What was even creepier was as I refunded him his money, he smiled at me and stared at me as he slowly turned around and walked away. I thought it was a little weird at first, but I let it go because that was the first time I ever saw this guy. I really started to get creeped out when he began to regularly come into the store, returning more printers. He began to come back so much, we eventually gave him a nickname, Printer Guy. When I saw Printer Guy for the second time, I thought maybe he just tried another printer, and it didn't work either. I tried not to think too much about it, but as the days and weeks went on, it became a routine for Printer Guy to come into the store and return printers. He would come to the store, return a printer or two, and would go back to electronics to get more. We know he didn't steal them because he always had the receipt. He went through the self-checkouts every time. The worker saw him ring up each one and pay for them. But why would one person need so many printers? Eventually, security started watching him. The day security and management told us to not take any printers back from him was the day he made it obvious he was up to something. He returned five printers in one day. Now it's none of my business, but one person does not need that many printers. The last time I returned a printer for him was that same day. He came up and asked me what was up. He was talking to me casually, just like the other times, but before I could even start the transaction, he leaned over to me and said, And between you and me, you don't need to know what I'm doing with all these printers. That's when I became absolutely terrified. I took that as code for, don't be in my business. But he then told me that his dog went missing, 
and he was returning the printers to collect a reward for anyone who found his dog. Whether he was telling the truth about his dog or not, that's when it became clear. He was buying the printers to print out flyers, and when he used all the ink, he would bring them back to get more. The printer is usually cheaper than the ink, so it makes sense why he would buy printers that already come with ink and then return them. After I gave him the money back for the printer he was returning, he once again gave me a weird smile and stared at me, saying, I'll see you around. At that point, I didn't even feel comfortable being around this guy. My other coworkers didn't either. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, but the way he acted then really made me fear for my safety. I just didn't feel like he was all there, mentally. I told security what he said to me, and that was the day management said that we could no longer take printers back from him. The last night I ever saw printer guy in the store, I was giving a break at the self-checkouts. At this point, most of my coworkers and supervisors were waiting for him to come back. We were told by management to call them whenever we saw him again. When he came into the store, he looked over at me and asked how I was doing. He looked at me once again with that creepy smile and stare and said, It's good to see ya. As he went to the service desk to return four more printers, one of my supervisors told him that we couldn't take any more printers back because he had returned so many. He was at the desk for a couple minutes and then slowly walked out of the store. His creepy smile was gone, only to reveal a petrifying look of anger. That was the last time I ever saw Printer Guy. I don't know what became of him. I don't know if he's still buying and returning printers. I don't know if he really had a dog that went missing, and if he did, I don't know if he found him. Walmart has a way of attracting many types of people. I have seen a lot of things while I worked for the company, but he was the creepiest person I have ever come into contact with at the store. Walmart does have low prices, but that definitely comes at a higher cost. If you find yourself in a Walmart, or any public place for that matter, just be careful. You never know what type of people are lurking around the corner.